When will Jesus restore his kingdom? That's what we started off with. And Christians and followers of Jesus have been asking that question for quite a long time. And we always think that was the time. If you're living in Ukraine, that would be a really pertinent question. When are you going to restore your kingdom fully? And actually, the Russian mothers and fathers will be saying the same things as they grieve the loss of their sons and husbands. And what about all the troubles that are taking place in Iran? And we have brothers and sisters there who are also being persecuted for their faith. When will Jesus restore his kingdom? And often we will even think at that in the troubles that we experience. Lord, this would be a really good time. Hurry up. And the disciples and the apostles, the followers of Jesus, were saying the same thing right at the beginning of this passage. They met together and asked Jesus, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus says, which is probably not what the answer they wanted to hear, well, not yet. <laughs> it is not for you and us to know the date. It is not time. And actually, I've got another job for you to do in the meantime. That's what Jesus is saying here. It's not, don't you worry about those things, and yet those things are really important. You've got the Roman Empire and all those things that are taking place in Jerusalem and Israel at the time, an occupied force. And so we want, him, you know, want these guys kicked out because they're having a tough time with them. And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the time. So what is or what was their job and what is our job today? Well, let's have a look what Jesus says. He says, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. He goes on to say, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. And that's our job. And it was the disciples and the apostles' job at the time. It's to be faithful witnesses to Jesus Christ in our lives. That's what verse 8 says. So what is a witness? Well, if you come from a legal background, you give a testimony, don't you? You often go to court and you say, this is what I have seen, this is what I have heard, and then you tell that to others. That's, that's really what a witness is. Well, being a faithful witness to Jesus is pretty much the same thing. It's about telling others our story of Jesus in our own lives. You know, what do I know? What have I experienced about this Jesus? That is really what a faithful witness is all about. It's about telling our story. This is who Jesus is to me. This is what Jesus has done for me. This is my experience of him in my own life, in our own lives. Now, we at Christ Church, we've heard loads of stories and teachings of Jesus in this place. In fact, I've de delivered a couple of them myself. So this is not a new teaching in this church. And many people in here have been walking with Jesus a long time. I've been a Christian for 22 years, and that's kind of like nothing to some people in this place, okay? It's been much longer. 22 years seems quite a long time, but actually, we've got a birthday coming up in 21 years shortly, okay? And this church has been going on before then. That's just the physical building. And there are people in this place who've been walking with Jesus a long time here and in other areas of other churches and other Christian worship centers. You know, we've been hearing his word from the Bible, 
We've been hearing about this Lloyd Jesus. We should know what Jesus is all about. And telling others is our job. You know, that's really what the Great Commission was about. Jesus said he wants us to be our faithful witness to him in our own lives. I'll talk a little bit more about that for us practically in a minute. Now, I've been reading quite a lot about some of the ancient ways of Christianity, particularly looking at the Celtic church. And it was interesting, around 400 AD, it's a long, long time ago, and the Roman church, the Rome, the Roman Empire, was disintegrating at that point. And the Romans left Great Britain. Okay? They were occupying an empire in Britain, and they were leaving at that point, around 400 AD. Now, some historians call that the Dark Age. But it wasn't a Dark Age for the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom didn't exist in that form then. But for, the, for Great Britain and this land, it wasn't a Dark Age because the light of Christ began to shine during the United Kingdom or Great Britain, England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. In fact, it really started to catch fire in the United Kingdom. We believe that Jesus is the light of the world. And actually, the, Jesus, the light of the world, started to ignite in this land. Isn't that amazing? Now, let's have a look at some of these guys. So some of them, one was called Hilda, and there's a gentleman called Aidan, but we also had what we called him St. Patrick now. Now, St. Patrick was someone who lived in Wales, England. And actually, he was abducted and sent over to, to Ireland. You know, this one just, they used to grab some young, young men in those days. And then he managed to come back to Britain. And then he felt called to go to Ireland again. But there was loads of people like that. And they were faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ in their own life. And these people, why Christianity really sort of ignited in the United Kingdom was because of three, four characteristics. They were authentic. So they believed the scriptures, which they have access to, and they lived it. It wasn't just an intellectual activity. They were authentic. This is what Jesus did. This is what he taught his disciples. And they put it into practice. That's what they did. This is why Christianity grew in the United Kingdom, because they were faithful witnesses who weren't hypocrites. They practiced what they preached. That's what being sort of authentic. They weren't perfect, and they were sinners just like us, but they were authentic. They lived that life. They believed in Jesus Christ, that he would give them life, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. And they believed the scriptures worked, and they lived that. And people found that very, very attractive in this land. Nowadays, there's lots of hypocrites and all sorts of things, aren't there? People who don't, don't really practice what they preach, but these men and women did. They also lived very simply. We live very complicated lives. I live a very complicated life. They live very simply. They didn't have loads of possessions. And they lived simply so they could share and so they could give to other people. And because they'd spent time with Jesus in his word and um, in prayer, he transformed them from their inside out. He made them holy. As I said, these people weren't perfect. They were sinners just like you and I. But because they were authentic, lived simple lives, the Lord made them holy, and people found that very, very attractive in this country. And they said that you must have something, well, we would like this. We can see how it, it's blessing you. I want some of that blessing in my own life. 
And these guys, and the men and women, loved the poor. They spent time with people. It's not really the model of mission that we kind of do now, but they really did live with people inside their communities. And they blessed them. And they were Jesus to these people. They were his representatives. And what could be better than that? Being Jesus to others. They're authentic. They live fairly simply. Over a period of time, obviously, they become holy. But that's what happens when you spend time with Jesus. And they were like him to others. And actually, people do need us to be Jesus to others. And how do we do that? Well, we kind of, we listen to people. We kind of don't rush away. We listen to them. And we, and we take seriously their concerns, their joys, and their sadnesses, and their troubles. And often, sometimes, they would obviously give out of their possessions, because that's a very loving thing to do. When you see people in need, you can give to them what the Lord has given us. As I say, they were authentic, they were real, and they loved the people within the communities in which they lived. Now, we can kind of do that also. And we shouldn't underestimate the power of just listening and being with people. You know, we've, the Lord has placed all sorts of people around us. Our families, our friends, our neighbors, our work colleagues. And because we're always busy, and you know, I'm kind of busy, it's very easy not to listen and spend time with people. But I think that's a real precious thing. If we spend time with people and just listen, Listen to what they're saying. People are very grateful for that. And then the next little bold thing is, which we'll talk about how we do this in a minute, we could pray for them, very quick prayers, because we're not very courageous and brave always. And what about you? We could pray for them. Because that's a kind of demonstrate we've listened and we've cared for them. And we believe in the Lord Jesus. We can bless them and intervene in their lives also. Now, sometimes, when I've got the courage to do this, I can do that to some of my colleagues at work. And not one person has ever said, I don't want to pr you to pray for me. No one has ever said that. Now, they could be atheists. They could have another faith. They have never said, I don't want you to pray for me. So they've told me a little bit of something. So can I just pray for you? I mean, if you're a Muslim, you believe in Jesus anyway. So let, can we just invite Jesus into that situation? It's not as if he's a complete stranger to, to Muslim people, for example. And you're not too big prayers. And it is really kind of scary sometimes. We'll talk a bit about that in a minute. I mean, one of my colleagues who is a bit of a hippie, he's kind of slightly new age, and he was telling me about a kind of a problem he was having. And I had to do this very quickly because my part of me was kind of saying, don't do this. But I knew it would have been a nice thing to pray for him. So can I just pr quickly pray for you? As I prayed very quickly, I just invited Jesus into the situation. Very quickly, it was a short prayer because my courage wasn't particularly very great at that time. And then he turned around and said, thank you for caring about me. That's what he said. Thank you. Because it was a demonstrate, demonstration I'd listened. And I prayed for him. Now, whether he believes in Jesus or not, that's not really the point but it's saying that's what a faithful witness is. We believe that Jesus can transform situations. And he didn't transform that situation physically for this person. But we gave him the opportunity to come in and do whatever he wanted to do. And I think we, we miss out a little blessings of that. And I felt really kind of, oh, thank goodness I did that. I was really pleased at that. I was encouraged. Because a lot of me in my head was saying, don't do it. He'll be... 
oh, you know, he'll be offended and there'll be this and this and this, that little voice that goes into your head demanding that you don't become a faithful witness. That's what it's like for me. It takes a lot of effort for me to ignore that and just say, oh, can I just do a quick prayer? I say, thank God, I've, I've finished now. I've finished that prayer. But I could quickly move on, scamper away. <laughs> And I think we miss out so much on that, and other people do. That's because we're bringing light into their, their difficulties. I, can't, I believe that the Lord does speak to us and, and prompts us to listen and pray for people. I really believe that. If we don't hear that, from my personal experience, I think there's, a num- there's two reasons why we don't hear the Lord. And you might want to test this. It might be the same for you guys. And one is because I'm not in a place where I'm receptive to what Jesus says. Because this whole book, this Bible, talks about that God wants to speak to us. He is a communicating God. That's what the Bible says. And there are people in here who know this because they've been walking with Jesus a long time. This whole book says that we have a talking God who's not silent, that he wants a relationship with us and the people around us. Now, can, do you hear the Lord speak to you? Because if we don't, it's because we're not in a place, where, and I don't mean this physical building, we're not in a kind of a place where we're open to hear him. It may be because we don't spend time with him just being quiet or just praying, or we're not in the Word. And so actually we've got sort of... It's like, you know, if I... I I speak to my parents on a Sunday. It's a little routine, okay? And um, it's a good routine. And... um, But, you know, that's a regular occurrence. So obviously we communicate. But it'd be like I'm not... not, If I didn't phone them up once a week and I didn't go home, we'd kind of... I'd be deaf to them. I've got to somehow... Allow that opportunity for me to hear from my parents. And I need to do that for Jesus as well. I need to be in a place where I'm kind of open to that. So that's what prayer is about, creating space to be with him. It's creating space where I can just read a little bit of this. You don't have to kind of read big chunks every day. Just being open. And I think then we hear from the Lord. Because I think the Lord does, over a period of time, as we grow into him, he will prompt you to say, I think you should pray for that person. Of course, then the, then the other reason why we don't hear from him is because the Lord does tell us things like that. And then we're disobedient. So you can do those good things, but when we hear that little voice in us that says, can you do this, pray for that person? And we kind of say No. We allow that voice and that, the other voice that says, don't do it, that doubt, we listen to that. And Jesus doesn't want us to sin, so he doesn't tell us things because he knows we're going to be disobedient. And then that's kind of sinful. He doesn't do that. And so sometimes he might not speak to us because of our disobedience. I've had to learn this kind of painfully. My, I'm not kind of a special person in this super spiritual. I just kind of want him to speak. And I'm having to learn to be obedient. And if I'm not obedient, then I don't hear him as much. So there's two things there. We need to kind of put ourselves in a place where we can listen from him. And then we need to kind of act on that. So if you're not hearing from the Lord... It might be because of two of those things. Now, all that sounds pretty scary, okay? But there is good news. There is good news. Because Jesus says, you don't have to do it by yourself. Because, verse 8 again, it says... But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. So we need his help. 
Thank goodness we need his help that we don't just do it by ourselves. I can't do this, what I'm doing now with you, in my own strength. I have to pray for help, even during the service. I think I need your help. It is really good and important to ask for the Lord's help because he gives us, he never asks us to do things that he is not prepared to come and join us in. So whenever you've got doubt or find difficulty, ask Jesus to come. That's what you need to do. So I need your help now. Invite him in. So when you feel weak, I'm just going to pause there a moment. So if you feel weak and you've not got much courage, ask for the Lord's help. Do one of those prayers. I need your help. Sometimes, this is how I would do it. If you don't turn up, I'm not doing it. I'm just, there's loads of things in my life. If you're not prepared to turn up, I'm not coming either. And I, and I do that in all sorts of things, even in my teaching job. I say, if you're not going in there, I'm not going in either. And he does come in. Try that. You could try that. Invite it. If you're not doing this, I'm not doing it either. If you don't come and join me, because I think that's a fairly fair thing to do. And the Lord has always strengthened me that, that way. And I, need to, I do that quite a lot. It sounds really flippant, doesn't it? It sounds very disrespectful. Well, I don't think I've offended the Lord. He doesn't, he's not grumbled back at me and said, Dean, you shouldn't do that. I think he's, that's the whole point, isn't it, that he joins us in those things. And when you feel weak, then we're strong because of him. So isn't it good that Jesus is saying, you don't have to do any of these things, be faithful witnesses, being kind to other people by yourself. If you really want me to spend time with that person and pray for them, I need you to turn up and then you step out. And you know, when you've done that, you'll feel really good because it, I usually feel good when, I'm being obe- when I've been obedient because I always feel like it's not very often. So I kind of think, yes, I've been obedient. Whereas I always feel like, ah, oh, when I haven't been. But I take that to the Lord. He is merciful and he forgives me. So in this passage, this is what Jesus has said to his disciples. And then what happens? Off he goes. He ascends to heaven. (laughs) Okay. He says, you're going to be my faithful witnesses, and I want to give you the power to do that. And off he goes. And just think of their reaction at this point. They are stunned. Are they stunned? Well, they're kind of just, I don't know, what are they doing? They're just sort of like, standing there. (laughs) They're standing there. Isn't God good? Then he sends two angels and gives them a little nudge, a little kick. So off you go. (laughs) What are you doing here? Off you go, come on, go to Jerusalem. And there he says, wait and pray. Next week is actually, I think, a really amazing opportunity. And when I knew I was preaching on this service, this, this passage, I thought, oh my goodness, what's happening next week? Next week is Pentecost, and it's Joseph's baptism christening. Think about that. And I was thinking, oh my God, what's the Lord saying in this, what's he going to do? There is a water baptism, and that day also marks Pentecost, when there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we've, that's what's taking place next week. We've got Pentecost as a reminder, celebration of the time the Holy Spirit came. And there's a water baptism. Now, I think that personally is very significant 
I think that's very significant for us here. So what does that mean? Well, I think the Lord is going to pour out his spirit in power next week. Because it's kind of, it's almost like the Lord is doing two things. It's almost like two reminders, a water and a spirit. I think the Lord is going to really come next week. If it's big or small, I think the Lord is still going to be here next week. Now, Jesus said to his disciples here, I want you to prepare So I want you to wait and pray. Because I think the Lord wants to give us more than we've currently got in this place and each of us personally. I think that's what next week's about. I think the Lord wants to give us more. You know, if we want to be more courageous and brave, if we want to be faithful witnesses, that I think the Lord wants to help us in that. We can sometimes view that as a banquet. The Lord has this banquet for us and is waiting for us. And do you know what we do when we come into a back banquet at church? We come with a little spoon. And we go like this. Thank you, Jesus. There's a big banquet in front of us. And we come with our little spoons. And we go like this. Oh, thank you. A spoon. The Lord lavishes us with all sorts of blessings. And I have little, sometimes low expect. I have low expectations of God. This is very sinful, and it's a wrong attitude. I know the Lord is really big, and He is generous, and He's you know I'm really blessed by Him. But often my expectation of Him for myself is very small. I've got a little teaspoon. <laughs> I've got a little teaspoon of expectation. And sometimes I have to remember, I think, Dean, you're bringing the wrong equipment. We should be like this. I want some dinner. Come on. When's the dinner on the table? (laughs) We should be bringing our knives and forks. There's a banquet there. We don't need a teaspoon. Throw that thing away. We need come with this sort of expectation. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm saying these things to you. I have to say this for myself. Okay, because my expectation's small. This is what I need to start carrying around. My knife and fork. Right, let's, um, let's do some serious. It is a banquet. Next week, um, there's going to be some food laid on. Not one of you is bringing a teaspoon. I've seen how you eat. <laughs> You'll be bringing... Now, what an insult if we came next week and we brought a little teaspoon None of us are bringing a teaspoon next week. We're going to be going, ah, this is my knife and fork. I can't wait. I challenge you to bring your own knives and fork next week because that's an attitude of expectation. Okay, there's the first challenge. Bring a knife and fork next week. It's Pentecost next week. I believe the Lord's going to turn up. There's a water and a bapt- um, spiritual baptism. Knife and fork. Let's see what the Lord is prepared to give us. Because we can't really do anything without the Holy Spirit. We are really weak. And we, I, all need the Lord's help. So to come back to that, prepare, the disciples prepared for the first Pentecost the outpouring of God's Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, that gives us power to do those things, to be faithful witnesses. And they prayed, but they waited and they prayed. And that's really the big challenge I want to kind of give to us all. In the week ahead, 
let's wait and pray. Let's get our hearts ready for next week. Whatever the state of our heart now, let's kind of spend time with him and ask for his help. Outside on the table is, um, I produced this preparation sheet. You don't need to have to do all of this. They're just little things, okay? And this is from um, St. Ignatius, okay? And they're little activities. They only take 10 to 15 minutes. You do one a day. And it's sometimes, we, look, there are people in Walking with Jesus, they don't need this. They know how to, to spend time with him. But I find this very helpful. I do this in the evening, but it doesn't matter when you do it. And it just helps us to create some little bit of a space where we can ask the Lord. You know, we want to take him a little bit more seriously and we want to prepare for next week, just like those disciples did. They prepared for Pentecost. And so it's about creating space. If if it's not helpful to you, then that's great. Do something else. I put kind of some base, you know, how do we get into a little bit of presence, being quiet and... And there are a number of little activities. You just do kind of one and maybe one the next day. They're just a series of questions that you're having a conversation with Jesus. You're effectively trying to be quiet for 10 minutes and just imagine Jesus is next to you and just run through the questions. And even if it's... I set a timer for 15 minutes and then when it's off, it's I've stopped. You know, that's just, you know, they're actually designed for busy priests. This is what it was for. But there's some real little questions there. And it just helps us to engage with the Lord and invites him in. That, that's all this is, okay? And sometimes we need that kind of help. And I, I do find this helpful personally. But there's a little bit of structure there. Because it would be really good if we prepared for next Sunday. And then we'll be able to be be more like to receive what the Lord wants to give us. And it says quite a lot that actually I want a little bit more of you in my life. I'm not doing anything, asking you to do anything that I'm not prepared to do myself, okay? I will be doing this myself. Well, I've said quite a lot. What I want to just do now, because I'm mindful of the time, I just want us to be quiet for a little bit. And uh, I just want to kind of just, part of this process of preparation is just invite the Holy Spirit just to meet with us. So I'm just going to do a couple of things now. But let's just be quiet and just be still. I've said a lot of words. You might just want to put your hands out like this because that's just kind of saying an attitude. I just want to receive and just be open. That, that's all this is. And so, Lord, I just, I'm not saying too much. I just, Father, I just pray that you just come and meet with us now.